So our last video ended with a, our last lecture ended with a uh, discussion of a planetary nebula. So William Herschel, uh, astronomer, uh, uh, was scanning the sky and he sev saw several of these little nebulae that were round like planets and fuzzy like a nebula. So he just started calling them planetary nebulae. And so it's left over when a sun like the when a star like the sun dies. Now, very small stars like red dwarfs probably never make it to this point. Uh, remember, none of them have ever died. The universe isn't old enough. They probably don't make it to the point of making a planetary nebula. They don't go through all those stages of the different uh, shells burning, and so they don't, they don't develop that instability. Really big stars, uh, much more massive than the sun, also don't go through this stage because uh, they do something entirely different when they die. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But stars like the sun, a uh, uh, little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, they're going to probably make a planetary nebula. Um, so, and you see planetary nebulae in star clusters. They're, they're fairly common. They, they don't last forever. They gradually expand and they die, uh, but they're not out there forever. And, and so a planetary nebula gradually dies. It expands. The, the gases that used to be the outer parts of the star dissipate into the inner star medium. Now, as, the, 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 uh, as it expands and contracts, most of this is going to be outer parts of the star. Most of the outer parts of the star are hydrogen and still helium. So it enriches the planetary medium with more of what's already there. But the nuclear fusion processes inside of the... the the, uh, the star as it was dying had also produced some carbon and some oxygen. So the planetary nebula uh, is going to have a little bit of turbulence in the, in, the outer, in, in the inner part of the sun, so it's going to dredge up some of that carbon, some of the oxygen in the outer layers as the star's pulsating and blows it into space. And so that means the planetary nebula has a little bit more carbon and oxygen than the regular inner star medium would have. And so as stars like the sun live and die, they start enriching the inner star medium with carbon and oxygen. So that means the later generations of stars and star systems have more carbon and oxygen available in them. Uh, so that's important because that's where the carbon and oxygen that we need to live comes from. So that means that, that in the search for life, in the universe, you don't look at the oldest stars as a place to find life because you need to have several generations of stars that produced these other elements out there in order to uh, have them be incorporated into another star system in which you can possibly look. Planetary nebula come in various shapes. Most of them are kind of round, but some are distinctly not. Uh, uh, again, round is the, the dominant shape. Um, th they're fairly common. Stars like the sun are not like, you know, uh, uh, super common, but the, the, the universe and the galaxy are very big, so there are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of them out there, and so they die uh, uh, probably about once a year. A star like the sun is dying and producing this, and so there's probably uh, tens of thousands of planetary nebulae in the galaxy at any one moment. Uh, they don't live for very long, just a few tens of thousands of years as they expand and dissipate, and so they're considered very short things. And so imagine animation of a star going through its life, and in the outer, uh, 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 it starts shedding uh, its outer layers as a red giant wind, and then it pulsates, it blows out a big cloud of stuff, and then it becomes a Again, you see a lot of planetary nebulae that are out, but the question, why are they not all spherical? And the answer is actually twofold. One, if you had a binary star, the companion would interfere with the symmetric uh, expelling of gas. So that would make it not spherical. Another thing that happens is that you've got these red giants giving off gas around their equator in the last part of their life, and so there's, right before they give all the planetary nebula, they're already surrounded in a big cloud, a big donut of, of, of slowly expanding gas. The planetary nebula comes away quickly, overtakes that, and, and initially comes out pretty round, but when it runs into it, you start getting an hourglass shape. And so depending on what angle you're looking at, you're looking down the hourglass and you see it. 
this is these this is for example right here is several uh pictures of the same planetary nebula taken with different wavelengths and so you can see the different gases are expanding and okay so star like the sun lives 10 or 12 billion years uh, leaves the main sequence swells up to be a subgiant as the core dies then you start the shell fusion shell fusion hydrogen into helium makes it swell up to be a red giant star then you start you have the helium flash and then it swells then then the, the then the uh shell starts fusing uh uh into hydrogen to helium but the core is now fusing helium into carbon and so now it becomes a horizontal branch star and then it runs out of helium in the core and now you have two shells an outer shell fusing hydrogen into helium uh, inner shell fusing helium into carbon, and the core is a dead carbon core. And now it swells up to be a second red giant. We call that the asymptotic giant branch. And then um, eventually starts pulsating, blows its outer layers off into space, and that gives you a planetary nebula. So the next question is, what happens to that burnt out core? Burnt out core is mostly carbon, a little bit of oxygen. It's really hot. It's very small. It's, it's compressed almost the size of the Earth. Initially, it's pretty bright, about 20 times the brightness of the sun, and super dense, uh, 10 to the 9 kilograms per cubic meter. That means if you had a, like a thimble full of it, it would weigh thousands of tons. And so uh, that's that, that gives you an idea as to just how compact this is. So you got uh, maybe just tons of, of material in just a tiny little 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 bit of it. Uh, so it's very very compact, uh, but it's very hot and glowing. It's it's white hot, but it's tiny. So what would you call such a thing that is white hot but is much much smaller than a red? Well, you would call that a white dwarf, and so that would be hot but very small. So that would be in the lower left part of the HR diagram. So that is where a white dwarf comes from. And that will be our next topic of study is white dwarfs.